show. This is the second edition of the Ask Darwin show. It's a show where the, me as mayor will be here to answer questions. The, some of the questions are going to be asked by Mark Farnan, who is sitting next to me. And then others can be asked by people calling in at 876-7236. Or they can use Gmail. And Mark will tell you how to do the Gmail. It's the first time this time, isn't it, Mr. Mayor? It's the first time. So uh, we're really right up to date. We'll try and do it. Uh, we've created a, an account uh, just so we can have additional citizen input. And anyone who wants to send their question in by email may do so at askdarwin at gmail.com. That'd be great. So I hope there's some listeners out there who will take advantage of that new opportunity. Well, it's my great pleasure to welcome Mark to the show. And uh, Mark, I welcome you, and you're going to be asking me questions. Uh, we'll see how much I welcome him by the time it's over. Yeah. But in any case... Mark is the principal behind Strategist Communications. It's a, a public relations firm. Would that be a fair way of that's a good putting uh, it? That's good. And uh, Mark is a very, very talented and competent man in his field. He oftentimes comes down to the city council, oftentimes advocating for things that I like, and at least as many times advocating for things I don't like. Uh, but he always does an excellent job. And so I'm looking forward to having him uh, pop the questions tonight. I'm happy to share the stage with you uh, tonight, Mary. And you're, uh, you're correct that uh, we do come down to city council sometimes. And this is the first time I've gotten to sit in the chair next to you instead of the one in front of you. And so uh, it's a much more comfortable uh, position to be in this evening. Well, it's a delight to have you here. Thanks, Mayor. Um, you know, we've had a long year this year. We can get right into the questions. And... Um, we're about at the end of this one. This will be our last show for um, 2009. And um, I know that you recently participated, along with the other city council members, in a retreat yes, that sir. examined uh, different, different aspects of, of uh, the city, including the budget, uh, policing, uh, safety, um, how we'll deal with a variety of problems and how we may propose some changes in the future. And I'd like to get into that tonight with you, if, that, if that's well, all right. That'd be great. I think people would probably be interested in what we talked about at that retreat. I might point out that uh, the council has traditionally had a spring retreat, uh, which is generally a short time after the election. Yes, sir. And uh, we usually go someplace out of town for the spring retreat and spend a couple of days at it and most of the staff goes down and talks to us in great depth about issues. And the council tries to discuss its priorities and give guidance to the staff sort of as to what it is that we're primarily interested in. This year has decided to go back to a system that we have had in the past, and that is to have a winter retreat as well. The winter retreat took place here in Columbia and so it uh, was something that we could do in one day, didn't have to go out of town, but we spent a full day. We started off at 8 o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and finished at 4.30 in the afternoon. It took place at the Reichman Pavilion out at Stevens Lake Park. Right. Both retreats are always open to the public. The press is there. The public is entitled to come and watch us crunch away and so and this will be an annual or a biannual event now I guess you plan in the future to do to hold both the spring retreat and the winter retreat or is well, that undetermined I, it's undetermined but uh, it seemed to work pretty well we uh, I think the council is finding that there are more and more things on the council's plate mm -hmm. and uh, maybe more things that uh, you might say are not exactly abstract, but they aren't solving an instant crisis type thing. For a long time, while I was mayor, we had basically a boom in Colombia. Right. And uh, we had population increasing at a higher rate than we'd ever had. And we had development occurring at a greater rate than probably we've ever had. And so it was all the council could do to keep up with requests. You would oftentimes be down there taking 
one side or another in a sure. development issue. And uh, with the slowdown, uh, the council has gotten to the point where it's able now to think a little bit more about, let's get a little bit ahead of the development. Let's see what we can do. Uh, really take the time to work out some planning ahead of the development. Mm -hmm. And uh, so some of the issues, we're able to take up some things that were pretty hard to take up in the past. Well, I know, Mayor, the, a lot of times the people say that being here in the Midwest and and being in a university town that we're insulated from the national economy and that we don't see the swings. But my sense is, is this year that this council at that retreat probably had at least one thing or many related one things on their mind and it had to be the economy. The economy is always on uh, our minds, but right now it's particularly yes. on our minds. And that's pretty interesting to think about in Columbia and the economy. Columbia has a uh, kind of a special economy. It's different than you would typically find in an American city. And we are a university right. community. And not only a university, but a major state university and the major state research institution. That's fundamentally important. Then we're a medical and uh, a very large regional medical center. True. And then we have, I call it, conservative insurance companies. We've got the State Farm, which is the largest presence in Columbia. Yeah. We've got the shelter insurance company here, and then the Columbia Insurance Companies, and some others that are basically headquartered here True. in Columbia. And if you talk about national statistics and they talk about the areas that survive a recession better than any other areas, it's education, medicine, and insurance. But, so, but nonetheless, we still saw the sting we did. Um, in terms of retail, uh, economic downturns that resulted in less development, development than we had seen in the 1990s. No instance. question about that. Uh, that's interesting because Columbia is a regional shopping area mm -hmm. and we depend heavily on sales tax. I'll talk about that in a minute. That's beneficial to Columbia in several ways. One is that by being regional, we have people who come in and contribute to our sales tax base. Sure. We, we don't have to provide as many services. We do have to provide the streets, the lights, the police. The roads. The roads. That actually, or, or many of them. Uh, 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 some that's are right. state, but uh, that's, that's right. right. But in any case, uh, we have to provide a lot, but yet we're bringing in money from people who don't actually have the requirements that a resident would have of the city. And so that's beneficial to us to be able to rely on sales tax. Well, let's go, let's but, go specific, all right, go but, right ahead. But when you have a downturn, we particularly feel that because they t people tend to withdraw on their spending. When they withdraw on their spending, that reduces the sales tax income. So what is really good for us in some ways hurts us in a downturn. The other thing is that I think it affected our economy a lot was people saw such a growth rate occurring for Columbia that there began to be a lot of building speculation mm -hmm. going on. And so we had, and I've had many people confirm this to me, this isn't just my private observation, although it is my private observation as well, that we had speculative building going on and we got going at an unsustainable rate uh -huh. and that it wouldn't have been possible even if the economy had continued to keep going at that rate but when the economy went down that sector of our economy has been hurt very significantly sure and that also contributes to sales tax because building supplies are a major source of sales tax so we've been affected in that way on the other hand with those steady industries, you want to call education, medicine, insurance, and insurance medical, industries, sure. 
we have a very solid base, and that's been to our benefit. What is our, what's our budget look like? I know that they had to have uh, discussions about uh, specific budget numbers or shortfalls or predictions of shortfalls in the tax base this year. Uh, what do we look like overall, despite the fact that we still have those base industries to rely on here and that do sustain us and may insulate us somewhat? I know that individually there are uh, many retailers who are feeling the sting this year. Oh, no doubt. And uh, more people spending less money um, just because their, their incomes are restricted. What's that look like in terms of the city picture this year? Well, because we rely very significantly on sales tax, and again, a little explanation is necessary here. If you take a look at Columbia's overall budget, is over $400 million. Right. It's a significant budget. Sales tax is only about 11% of that, but the thing that you've got to recognize is that it's the general fund that provides the police, the fire, the streets, the uh, parks and recreation, the, <coughs> the things that we think of maybe as core city services come out of the general fund. The general fund is supported by sales tax and by the pilot of payments in lieu of taxes from our utility. And they make up of almost 65% of the general fund. The rest of the money comes out of our enterprise funds. That's the electricity and the sewer and the water and so forth. So it's a, uh, you gotta understand that the, where we hurt is in the general fund by reduction of sales tax. Right. And so that, it's a big part of that. And so as our sales tax goes down or doesn't grow, then that has a disproportionate impact on our general fund. And that makes it harder to supply the base services. Or the discretionary services. Or the discretionary services. Right. And uh, so we've had to try and say, now how are we gonna handle this? Well, we do have a reserve fund and we have as a policy that we'll try and keep a reserve fund equal to 16% of our budgeted expenditures. We'll keep that available uh, so that if things really go bad, we can dip into that or we can uh, cover debt service or whatever has to be done with respect to that reserve fund. And uh, so uh, the, when our income goes down, then our expenses have to go down. Right. And that's, we've been pretty successful with that. So Mayor, what kind of, what kind of measures specifically were talked about at this to uh, either implement during this coming budget year or that in uh, retrospect may have had to be implemented that have been thought of before but never invoked? I told, well, here's what we're having to do. We're looking primarily at cutting expenses. Uh, that seems to be the uh, best we can do. Now then, this year, we in the in the 2009 budget, mm -hmm. we have pared the expenses down about as far as we can go without really severely cutting service. So they cut your salary. And they cut my salary from zero <laughs> to zero to less than that. <laughs> That's right. And uh, so the council has never really been a drain on the budget, and but. Uh, We've gotten the departments to spend less than they budgeted to spend. Now, some of that's going to hurt us. For example, uh, some of it is postponing replacement of equipment. Mm -hmm. Some of it is not filling some job slots that ought to be filled. Uh, we uh, are saving money in those kinds of ways. But we're not facing, like some cities, uh, even some cities in Missouri, we're not facing layoffs right now or, uh, or that I'm aware of. No. And we're not uh, facing um, huge uh, deficits in our pension funds and our ability to fund that or our health insurance. Is that true? Or, that or, is or true. We, no, well, we can't face that. And as a matter of fact, uh, 
there has been a government accounting policy change that requires us to cover all of these uh, expected liabilities that come from the pension funds. Right. And uh, the city has worked out a system where we're setting aside the money to cover that. And so that we aren't going farther and further and further in debt on our books with respect to future obligations on the pension funds. But pension funds, like the fire pension fund, the police pension fund, and then the regular city workers pension fund are all going to require more money. And we have no control over that. Uh, it's not something where we can say, okay, we're going to cut back on that. Mm -hmm. We can't. So what we realize is that if everything stays the same, suppose the economy levels out, and the sales taxes continue to come in at the present rate. Mm -hmm. And uh, that maybe we have a better year in the sale of electricity. You know, we had a cool summer. Right. So we got uh, less revenue. We got less revenue out of our payments in lieu of taxes. And so, uh, but if we have a hot summer and we have a uh, cold winter, a cold winter, which we're supposed to so, have. Uh, supposedly we're having that right now. Even though, interestingly enough, when the uh, predictions came for a warm winter, uh, the Ameren people wrote us a letter and said, look out, your payments in lieu of taxes, or actually they pay what we call a gross receipts tax. Right. Uh, your gross receipts tax is likely to go down. You better be prepared for sure. it. But in any case, so far it's been cold. But uh, the, assuming they come in at a normal rate, mm -hmm. we know that these pension costs are going to go up. Right. And so the net result is we've still got to figure out ways to deal with it. Well, now, on some of, those, some of those ways, Mary, isn't it true that um, you may not buy a replacement fire truck this, in this calendar year? But that can last only so long. And you may mm -hmm. have to do that down the road. In the short term, um, are, is, is the council generally making decisions that would preclude immediate services or things that we think of as uh, immediate, uh, such as acquisition of a land or a park? Or the, um, are they scaling back on road repair and construction? Or any of those types of categories that people tend to have a real hands-on use for. In, in other words, we never ride the fire truck, but we do drive the streets. All right. We are not going to be cutting back on those, but I need to explain that too. All it, right. it, the whole thing is pretty complicated. When it comes to the parks, we basically sustain the parks out of a parks sales tax. Mm -hmm. Now, it too is suffering, but we used to pay for the parks out of general out revenues. Out of general revenue. Sure. We still contribute to the parks out of general revenue, but at a modest rate. If we didn't have the parks sales tax, we would then have to start paying for the parks out of general revenue, which right. would be a terrible blow to the general revenue fund. And uh, everybody would lose some services as a result of that. So, in a sense, uh, the reduction in general revenue is not going to affect parks. And it isn't going to affect streets too much because we have a transportation sales tax that we use to pay for streets, bus services, and things like that. Got it. But the, uh, but the others, like the fire and the police and the, the general accounting that we do, running the municipal buildings, uh, street maintenance and those things, we that's where your general revenue fund comes in, uh, and so and you're trying to protect those, we're trying to those protect basic all services. The, they're basic. We need to protect them. Mayor, I know that one of the points of discussion at the uh, retreat was, even though the times are tight, and even though everybody is uh, forced with uh, making tough decisions about where you allocate money. There, is, there are at least some members of the council that believe this is the time to make investments in, in things that 
actually have a payback, maybe not in the short term, but in the long term, or in areas such as um, economic development or um, uh, recreational services or things that may actually have a return. Oh, I, it, I'm but a do we have in it. do we have money to be able to actually invest in it right now? You know, a lot of people have taken their money and have drained their uh, their retirement accounts because of current current uh, uh, economic woes. You're not draining your your accounts from the future, but do you have the money to invest right now? We have some money. We have a reserve fund, uh -huh. and uh, we have a as a policy. We have a reserve fund that is equal to 16 percent, supposed to be equal to 16 percent of our anticipated expenditures. Right. And that's only good, solid planning. You, if something goes really wrong, you have some money to cover it. Mm -hmm. You have uh, money that will cover all your bond payments if things go wrong. And that enables you to get a good bond rating. When, therefore, when you borrow money, it costs sure. less and so forth. We have significant borrowing power in the city. And I, we always need to be taking a look and say, wait a minute, if when prices are down, people need work, we can create jobs by doing certain things that will have a payback to us in the future. Right. And so I think we always should be looking at those kinds of What kind of, uh, give me an ex uh, example or give me the categories that uh, basically would fall into that. And my sense is, is that city uh, has proposed investment in um, shovel ready sites for economic right. development. That seems to me like that, that has a payback to it. What it, are other things like well, that? Well, economic that you development is clearly one of the areas where we have some uh, great opportunities, I think. Mm -hmm and we need to make the appropriate investments in economic development. But they have to be smart, right? and they have to be good. And they have to, when you look at the future, be able to say that we will have benefit as a city from this economic development. So investment. a measurable return on investment. So you need to try as best you can. Mm -hmm. Anytime you're trying to measure the future, you're taking a risk. We all know that. Right. Uh, there isn't anybody here that I know of who can tell you for sure what the future is going to bring. Right. But you can calculate the risk and you can make those investments. Well, economic development, properly done, is one of those uh, places, I think, where we ought to be making some investment. We ought to be making some investment, I think, maybe in some of our streets and jobs like that, where we know it's going to have to be done. Mm -hmm. We know it will add to the quality of our community, sure. the effectiveness of our community, and we can get it done cheaper right now than we'll probably be able to get it done in the future. Where does that? Uh, so, uh, well, shovel ready sites is another thing. Uh, investing in uh, things like insulation of houses where we could then possibly avoid having to pay so much for peak electricity in the future or not have to buy some generation power. We could make those investments now, put people to work, mm -hmm. have people live better in their homes, and we'll get a return. So it's a green, so, a green energy, uh, much like they're doing on the national level right. or have proposed, and we're doing it here at home. Where does uh, tourism and uh, where does tourism and recreation, that sort of thing, fall in on the spectrum? Well, tourism is something that we try and support here in Columbia, uh, but it is, to a large extent, supported by its own tax, the room tax, mm -hmm. which is turned out to be a very valuable addition to Columbia. The way uh, the room tax works is half of it, essentially, is used to promote Columbia to the outside. Right. The other half is used to make Columbia a destination. And I think that combination has really worked well. And one of the interesting things is it's worked well enough that there's probably been an overbuilding of hotels in Columbia, mm -hmm. at least as compared to what the travel economy has done in general. Sure. I'm sure when you decide to build a hotel, that's a long-term plan and project, and you can't just cut it off because 
travel goes down for a while, but our rooms <coughs> are in excess supply, I think. Uh, but I think that's going to come out. But the investments in making Columbia a destination community mm -hmm. have worked well for everybody who lives here as well as making it something that will help fill hotel rooms. All right, so we've talked about the ways that we can save money. We've talked a little bit about ways that we could spend our money smart. Uh huh. What if we just need to go get some more money? I know that another topic that was brought up at the, um, at the budget retreat was uh, the potential that there will be different bond issues or, or tax issues on the ballot. And if you could talk to me a little bit about what you see for the coming year in terms of the ballot schedule, what you, ex what you believe may be on the ballot in terms of bond issue, sewer issue, uh, tax I issue. I, I mean, I, nobody who's the mayor wants to go out and say, we're going to raise your taxes and give you less. But I do know there are times when we do go to the voters and ask for things that are necessary or that sort of thing. Maybe you could give us a preview of what to expect that we may see uh, at the polls this year. All right. Well, first, I think there's a substantial chance that the schools sure. will be asking for money. And while people need to understand that the schools are operated by a separate government than the city government, there's the school board, it's an elected school board, mm -hmm. they hire their superintendent, superintendent hires the staff, and they run the school independently of the city government, independently of the county government, yet we cooperate a sure. lot. I am a believer that any investment in education is about the best investment you can make for a community. And I've got a lot of things that I'm interested in seeing the city be able to do, but I don't think anything is more important than properly supporting the education in Columbia. So. I can assure you that even though I'm not on the school board and have no direct relationship to the school board, I'm an advocate of their proposal to increase the, the funds that will go to the, the school. Now then, when it comes to the city, um, we in April, uh, let me see. I'm going to have to refresh myself. Mayor, let's do this. Let's uh, uh, let's go to the phone lines if we can. Oh, is I there think somebody? We, I think we have a I think we have a call from a caller, and let's uh, let's hear it in the studio if we do. Hello, caller. Are you there? Uh, good evening, Mayor. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, to uh, take calls like this. Um, yeah. I had a question. I was wondering if you would picture any um, any. Uh, Oh, eco-friendly advancements in, in Columbia in the next uh, in the next 2010. I know there's there's a couple solar panel arrays popping up around town. I was wondering if there's anything like that coming up uh, next year that we can expect to see as far as you know more earth-friendly advancements in town. Well, now I mentioned one that I think is of critical importance, and that is the idea of getting some insulation into right. a lot of our building stock. The, by far the best way to uh, save money uh, and the best way to pay for electricity is to not Conserve it. have to do it at all. Sure. Right. And a group of us went to Austin, Texas uh, a few weeks ago and saw their system where they build what they call virtual power plants. Yeah. And they do that by investing very, very heavily in what they call the demand side. And so they pay people not to use electricity. They pay people to insulate these buildings. Now we do some of that here, right. but not on the same scale that they do. And so I believe and would advocate heavily for upping that program. Uh, and I, that is a major step forward in the green uh, economy. It's also a major step forward in just the climate. Mayor, the, co the caller mentioned specifically uh, solar panels, that right. type of thing. He's seen some of that. Does the city provide incentives for that level of, um, of transition uh, we, to alternate forms of power? We do, uh, but uh, they don't match the market too well. We actually have a program where we will pay people that put in solar panels uh -huh. for the electricity that they add to the grid. 
And uh, so and we also have a program where we pay people for solar water heating. Right. If they will, we will pay for installing the solar water heating. We also have a program where we will help with the, uh, provide some economic incentive to put on solar panels. And the Frito-Lay people, uh, the Quaker Oats, right. basically, have put on a solar panel on their building out on Route B, and they're using it. And you go out there, and they've got a meter that shows exactly how much that the solar panel is uh, producing for them. And they have made application for another uh, uh, another panel, another, and another panel, subsidy, sure. Another uh, with a certain amount of help from the city right. on uh, to put on top of their plant, and uh, but there may be others who made this application as well. I don't know, but they're doing a terrific job uh, of demonstrating that. We also have a solar panel array that has been put on by Dow Chemical. It's over by the. What, it's by the West Lakes, behind the West Lakes, uh, over on Walnut Street, uh, by Mockins Ford, you mm -hmm. know what I'm talking about? Yes, sir. Back behind it, there is a, and they are studying, working with the university, uh, how much success you can have with solar panels. Any geothermal included in that, uh, insulation, those types of things? Well, let me finish on the Go solar right panel in. for just mm -hmm. a second. Uh, the city has, on the new city hall, has put up the hardware to install solar panels. The private sector gets tax breaks by, they get, actually get tax credits right. by putting in solar panels. The government does not. Mm -hmm. So it's more expensive for us to do it than to have the private sector do it. So we try and help the private sector. But right now, it probably doesn't make true economic sense in Missouri at this point to install solar panels and expect to pay back. And so we're working with people, we're encouraging it, but we got a little way to go before we're going to see a lot of and it. And we still didn't get that green roof on City Hall. We didn't get that green roof on City Hall. I'm very disappointed about that. I thought that maybe the alternative form of energy you were going to come up with tonight was that we were going to attach a generator to that bike of yours, and every time you ride 50 miles that you uh, produce another kilowatt of power. Well, that's a good idea. <laughs> you know, my little Prius does that. Well, there you go. You put on the brakes, it's generating power. But... Uh, I'll tell you, when you ride your bicycle, you're not using any, you're not sending any money overseas, you're not polluting the air, you're getting exercise. I had to give you else. a chance to get yeah, your pitch. I, so, but, uh, so you're saying that this council uh, generally and in, in the city staff do have an eye toward uh, the, the uh, promotion of green projects in this, in this community, and you mm. believe that it will see an increase. If we're going to do predictions for next year, one of your predictions would be maybe. But we'll see I, more I, of it. We're going to see more of it. I think that All we're right. going to see a much higher emphasis on the trying to get actual demand side programs in place. All right, let's go back then. Although I do think the city needs to get credit for what it's done. It's done an amazing amount. Let's let's go back to that. We were talking at the time when we had our last call um, about the ballot schedule, and I want to go back to that right. for just a second. We do know that there, uh, or we can. We'll guess that there's going to be a, um, a ballot initiative for the schools on the April ballot. Uh -huh. Will we see anything from the city on that other than a few people who are running for your job and a few people in a few of the wards as candidates? Will we, can we expect to see other initiatives, whether they're tax or, uh, initiatives, bond initiatives, or even, uh, as was rumored, that we may try and clean up the city charter? I think there are likely to be some city charter amendments proposed. All right. And one of them would be whether or not to pay council and the mayor. And uh, I do support the idea of paying the council and the mayor. Although after having served You're about 15 16 years, years too late. I, that's right. Uh, <laughs> I, when I, 
whatever they end up paying them, I'm going to can't help but multiply that by 15 and that's think, right. uh-oh, that's what I gave up. But nevertheless, uh, I think it's probably a good idea. Right. Uh, the second thing that uh, there are just some technical issues. One of the interesting technical issues is that the charter says that the water and light director must be a professional engineer. Right. And maybe, On its face, that sounds like a good idea. It sounds fair uh, in a way, mm -hmm. but as our water and light department has grown into a real big business, essentially, we really need the CEO type more than we need the engineer. Probably in the old days, when, you, when the charter was written, the, you really needed an engineer because that was primarily what the director did. The director today probably doesn't, may not need to know engineering much at all, has a bunch of really good engineers working for him or her, mm -hmm. but really needs to be a CEO of a business. Now, probably when you were a kid, they just had a plumber, didn't they? No, that's right. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, the, and they didn't have electric lights in, so we didn't have to worry about well, that Well, you part. had a yeah. mule who walked on this treadmill, it. and it worked pretty well. But they, uh, the, the idea is that it's out of date. And so when it comes time to hire our director of uh, the water and light, we're limited because the uh, best candidates in many cases aren't engineers at all. So we'd like to change that. Got it. And so there are other technical changes that need to be made. One of them has to do with the initiative ballot provisions. Uh, the, the present charter calls for the city clerk to within 10 days after getting the signatures on an initiative to certify those signatures. Well, certifying them means checking to see that people are actually residents of the city of Missouri, uh, city of Columbia, and a whole bunch of hard work, really, but it takes time. When the charter was Past, it was a much smaller population, didn't have nearly as, because it's a fraction of the number of people who voted for mayor in the last election. Right. And so the number has just increased dramatically over the years. Not only that, under the present law, it's the county clerk who uh, does the counting and so forth, because the county clerk is the one who certifies elections. Got it. And so now the city clerk has to take all that stuff over to the county clerk, the county clerk may be in the middle of a statewide election or something like that, just doesn't have the power to do it. Because you can't ever tell when somebody's going to turn in an initiative sure. petition. And so we need to change that to allow more time and uh, make it modern, make it practical. Mayor, when you, when you do that and you propose these amendments to the city charter, does it open the charter up? Uh, I know that uh, when they have a constitutional convention, in the, the states and they want to change their constitution, do it by convention rather than by single amendment. Does it open us up to a lot or all different changes at times or in, uh, could we expect to see uh, other ideas thrown into the pot once, once the charter is open? There are two ways to amend our charter. Okay. Uh, one of them is for the council to propose an amendment and put it on the ballot, which is what we'd be doing with these technical amendments. Sure. The other is for an initiative procedure where the people go out and gather the signatures and uh, then uh, cause it to go on to the ballot. That, neither of those is the convention that you're talking about. So the likelihood of there being a runaway situation yes. where people completely take one idea and develop it into a whole lot of unrelated ideas right. uh, is probably not too great a risk. And now, in addition to that, and then I, we do have an email from one of our uh, viewers, uh, but uh, in addition to a that... A Gmail. No, a right. Gmail, no, that's, that's right. right. Okay. Um, what I uh, wanted to know is uh, we do have some other issues in, in addition to the elections, and we're also going to see in April... Uh, uh, the question about cameras downtown. 
uh, will be That's on right. the April ballot that as right. well. So we will be voting on that. I know that doesn't change the charter necessarily in its fundamental core. No, it doesn't change the charter at all. It's an ordinance. And it becomes an ordinance. That's and right. it was an initiative. But it was an initiative. Just as the charter requires signatures in order to change the charter, we have an initiative procedure where if people don't like what the council has done, they can initiate a change, right. and that's what's happened on the cameras downtown. Well, that, and this this leads uh, well uh, our two previous topics: the economy and uh, in initiative petition. Actually, lead very well into this. Um, our viewer writes in on Gmail. You see, you're you're a 21st century kind of guy. I'm sitting here with this I'm little. I'm just delighted to have a Gmail. I know right. we've got a mini netbook here. We're sitting okay. here. We're downloading Verizon Wireless. You're doing Gmail. I, you you'd need about four or five more terms on the council, maybe. Well, uh, that that I probably do, but I guess maybe I won't do that. Here's the question: <laughs> Do you feel that an increase in the relationship between nonprofits and local government could help the economy and the overall community growth? So, uh, with a, a stronger relationship between the city government and nonprofits here, help the community economically. Well. I'm not sure how to answer that because I'm not sure what they're driving at as to where the weakness comes in, but certainly nonprofits add a tremendous amount to the community. They do so many things that we cannot do merely on the tax dollar or through sure. the city. Particularly it, as they relate to services um, for people who are maybe on the edge of the economy. Absolutely, uh, and we've got nonprofits who deal with homeless. We've got uh, who, the people who have the fundamental need for food, the food banks. Mm -hmm. We have nonprofits that uh, deal with truancy. We have uh, nonprofits who deal with uh, kids who are in trouble. We have nonprofits that help people find jobs. We have nonprofits. And job training. We provide job training. We have uh, nonprofits that provide jobs for people who are otherwise probably unemployable. Uh -huh. We have nonprofits that provide every imaginable social service that you can think of uh, for battered women, for people who are re-entering from the prison system. Sure. Uh, it, it's just uh, the list is amazing. Well, Mayor, it looks like and at so least in obviously uh, cooperation between the city and the nonprofits is important. And it, it looks like, at least in two ways, it relieves the city, the pressure on the city budget for the responsibility for some of those things, not all, but some, it would relieve that pressure. But it also seems like they may augment some of the things that you all encourage. The no UK, you fund a program of economic development. Some of these groups may take the mantle of the job training a function that we don't provide as a city per se. We may fund some things, but we don't provide it like we provide mm -hmm. fire and police protection. Um, maybe that's what this, uh, this, uh, this uh, mailer is. I might explain something. Uh, uh, I don't know whether this is a direct answer to the question or not, but uh -huh. there was a government program that was essentially similar to the Community Development Block Grant Program, where we have that now. And the federal government, we're what we call an entitlement city. Right. And the federal government sends us about a million dollars a year. Is that the CDBG the funds? The CDBG, right. Community Development Block Grant. And we're supposed to use that to help in, and it's set up by census tract, uh, by low income census tract. We're supposed to use that in such a way that it benefits people in the lower income census tracts. Now, this program I'm talking about was a similar program, except it was for social services, mm -hmm. primarily. Now, the federal government cut that off a good many years ago. But the city of Columbia, which was very unusual, I might point out, said, we believe that those social services are necessary and that we can't really provide them as a city. Right. If we tried to just use our tax dollars on our own social services programs, we'd we wouldn't get enough bang for our buck. Sure. It's much better to support organizations that are experts at this and can use other funds to leverage. And so we, in spite of the fact the federal government took that program and ended it, 
we continued to budget for that amount, increasing it a little bit every year to at least make up for inflation. Mm -hmm. And we do that to this very day. And so we have a commission, a community services commission, that takes applications from various social services organizations, rates those, makes recommendations to the council as to how the allotment for that year is going to be spent. Right. We as a council review their recommendations, generally accepting most of them, and then we allocate that money out. So the city does do a lot more than most cities ever think about in trying to work <clears throat> with these nonprofits. Were those uh, the were the the requests uh, higher this year in um, in the, in the number they were asking for? They and were. And were you were. able to meet the ask, or were the the we expenditures actually, lower this year? We actually unhappily cut back on the expenditures by about five percent. About five percent. And uh, that it was a, a kind of a hard thing to do because you recognize that demands for social services are up. That's probably has something to do with this question, I would guess, just the uh, the fact that there are um, organizations that do provide services and, and probably this is the, the uh, most visible sign of communication between nonprofits in the city, but I know that behind the scenes uh, there are many people who on, on the city staff that populate the boards of many of the nonprofit organizations oh, yes. and take an active uh, interest in and participation in the operation of those boards on a regular basis. Let's go back um, and think, let, let me ask about this. It, it, it's kind of the, this time of year and um, I guess it's a discretionary expenditure, but this may be something that I wanted to get to before the end of the evening at least. Um, we talked about cold weather. We talked about um, uh, sp specific maintenance responsibilities that we have. What are we going to do when it starts snowing tonight? Not just. Well, we're I know hoping you'll it won't be tonight. I know <laughs> you'll you'll dig me out, but uh, what are we going to do for the other streets? Well, I don't know. It depends on the questions you ask, right? I guess that's true. Is, is the <laughs> no, uh, are we are we prepared this year for um, what has been guesstimated to be heavier uh, snowfall and colder temperatures? We are. We have a snow policy, and I urge people who have questions about this to go to the city webpage and look up our snow policy. It's all published right there. It's adopted by the council, and it's quite firm as to what it is. And it amounts to this, that if you have less than four inches of snow, and tomorrow's snow is expected to be two inches. Correct. Although it could, as we well know, exceed the forecast. But yeah. if it's less than four inches, what we do is we do a priority system, but we clean the streets and we go to the priority streets and then the next highest priority and then the next highest priority. And the highest priority are those that have very steep, difficult aspects to them sure. or, uh, and then and they it, carry a high volume of and traffic. then the next ones are the highest volume of sure. traffic then your major arterials and so forth but may not have quite as much traffic and then it's the residential well we will clean the the highest priorities uh, using overtime if necessary mm -hmm. and, until we get them cleaned up all right when it comes to the residential streets we will clean them but they are lower priority. They don't get cleaned until the others are done, and we don't pay overtime. We'll let the, they'll only be cleaned during the regular work day of the city employees. All right. If it's more than four inches, we still do the same thing, except that we will go into overtime to pay for cleaning the residential streets. And so, and so it's not allocated on the basis of where each council member lives. That's right. Their street doesn't get clean first, right? You know, I, when we had that terrible snow uh, about this time, it was a little bit earlier, actually, a few years ago, people would call me and say, oh, the rich people are getting their streets clean, yeah. and I'm not. And I was proud to be able to say, I haven't I, seen a blade on my street in weeks. I haven't seen a blade on my yeah. street, and I live at the bottom of a hill, and I've had the snowshoe out, basically. Sure. And so, uh, 
we follow that policy. The, the maps showing the priority streets are all on the way. Okay. And anybody can go look and see. And we will follow that policy. Uh, formula. Let me ask you, and, and I, I, I believe I know the answer to this, but you can. This is another cooperation um, uh, question. Many of the major streets in our community are are state highways. That's so right. when we get on to Providence Road or Stadium or 63 or I-70, and those are major streets in our town. We don't have responsibility for snow removal on many portions of those roads. That is right. And uh, needless to say, the highway department gives Highway 70 its priority. Uh huh. And it's going to do Highway 70 before it is going to do Providence Road or Stadium or Business Loop 70 or whatever it might be okay. that is a state road. And Highway 63 as well. Right. So uh, w people will say to the city, how come you're not doing this? This is a major road. Another thing that happens is that we'll have a truck that has a big snow plow on it, right. and it'll be driving down stadium with a snow plow uh. up because it's going from one part of town to another, or it's going to get another load of uh, gravel or another load of cinders for those of you who love cinders so much, Poof. and uh, so forth. And we get criticized for that. We ha because they think, well, they're just driving around with the snowplow up. They're actually doing it for efficiency purposes. It's much better uh, be <coughs> going after that new load with the plow up than to be dragging it along for no purpose. Well, we we, have, have, been, a, a we have been working with highway departments so that we can run a scraper along as when it's uh, on the road. But it's not our responsibility to do that. So it is a cooperative uh, relationship. It is. And, and there just, is cooperation. It, I it, you. But it is that there is a defined responsibility for the different streets. That is correct. And a de defined hierarchy. And uh, we even have some issues like that with the county. We have some streets that are part in the county, part in the city. Sure. And we work out agreements with the county. The, um, um, the other piece of this that I have heard people talk about in coffee shops a million times, and I think that I, I think it's a bad idea, but you tell me. People always say, well, you know what? They still run those garbage trucks every day. Why don't we just put a snow plow in front of the garbage truck, and they could do both things at once. They could clean my street while they pick up the trash. Well, uh, it wouldn't work. And if, if, let's start right now with the simple fact is the garbage trucks have all they can do to do their route without bothering to plow. The particularly street. when it's snowing. And uh, particularly when it is snowing. Right. And so you would be taking the garbage truck off of its, what it's built to do and what its crew is trained to do mm -hmm. uh, to start plowing streets. And it just wouldn't work very well. Right. And you would end up with the garbage not being done well. The streets wouldn't be plowed well, and it just wouldn't be a, a proper thing. The equipment, those garbage trucks are not built for that, and that, that's just, the equipment isn't right. Yeah, I got in an argument about that at coffee the other morning, and I, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you agree with me. Well, good. Yes, I'm glad to hear that, too. What, yeah. that's, that is luck. Now, uh -huh. Mayor, we have about 10 minutes left in the show. If you are um, a caller and uh, would like to call in, you may. Call us in the last few minutes of the show at 876-7236 or can mail in your last minute questions. Email them at uh, askdarwin at gmail.com. We have 10 minutes left. All right. This is the last show for this year, and this is going to be your last full year as mayor of right. this fair city. Uh-huh. Been in here for quite a while. Yeah. You've seen a lot of different changes. Let's do predictions for next year. Oh, all Everybody right. does this every year, right. and uh, they, they'd look at the year in review. I think this retreat kind of covered part of that. Um, let's talk about economic development. Do you see any major economic development initiatives or the fruits of major economic development issues on the immediate horizon or something that you believe in it during next year we'll be able to point our finger to and say, there you go. There's a good one. I have a very optimistic outlook 
for Colombia's economic development. Right. And I think that we have changed our strategy for the better. I am a great believer that Colombia has special strengths and our economic development should be based on those special strengths. Uh -huh. There is a standard used by a lot of cities that they say what we need to do is go out and get manufacturing and we're going to compete for this manufacturing. Right. Competing for manufacturing is a tough proposition. Manufacturing to a large extent has been exported. True. The whole world is competing for manufacturing. How do people compete for manufacturing? For most manufacturing, the only way that they can really compete is to say, all right, we're going to lower your costs. And True. how are we going to lower your costs? Tax abatement. We're going to give you tax abatements. We're going to take it out of the schools. Free land. Take it out of the parks. Mm -hmm. We're going to take it out of the streets. We're going to take it out of the fire department. And then we're going to give it to you to create some jobs, bring some more people to town who need the services that we've given all the money away for mm -hmm. that we would pay for. And you are competing with thousands and thousands of other municipalities. So what's our alternative? So our alternative is to say, now wait a minute. We've got some things here in Colombia that most places don't have. And so what we need to do is say, all right, we've got a research university which has some of the brightest students, brightest faculty, brightest researchers in the world, that some manufacturers, some business people need Mm -hmm. And they can come here because there's no other choice but to come here. And they can bring their people here because Columbia is a great place to live. Now their people could live anywhere, but they want to live in the very best possible place. And so we make Columbia the very best possible place. We play on the strengths of the university, the research that is going on out there. And we've developed a whole system working with the university. And I'd say the university has taken this on as a, a major mission of its own uh, to help people take ideas that have come out of the university, to commercialize them, to work with startup companies, to find financing for the startup companies, build a business park out there, to work with the state to come up with proper uh, training and incentives. And we are going to be able to attract businesses to Columbia that other people can't attract. And right. that, to me, is the perfect strategy. Mayor, we've got one minute left. Okay. So, um, but anyway, I see a bright future, and I think we're going about it in the right way. The last question that we had was one that was given to me, handed to me before we came in today. You said that you were a very positive man, that you were a believer. Yeah. And uh, in this holiday season, I was asked to ask you, do you believe in Santa Claus? Well, of course, of course, <laughs> yes. uh, For all you young listeners out there, there is a Santa Claus. Thanks, Virginia. <laughs> uh, Mayor, we're about out of time. Thank you for uh, inviting me into uh, the show tonight.